so the attendees are just starting to come in now so we'll just give it um, another minute for the rest of the attendees to join and then we'll start. You can see the attendees coming. Yeah, I can see the attendee number ticking up. So with Max, we'll just wait till it levels out a bit, the number of attendees, and then and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll introduce. It really does feel strange. <laughs> and there's no audience in front of you, wow. yeah. Speaking to you. But they can uh, they can hear us and see us, and I'll I'll be here, so you can I'll be uh, listening. <laughs> Good, you and Raj. Yes. <clears throat> Great. So, um, hi everyone. I think the attendee numbers have started to level off now, which means um, everybody's uh, here that wants to join, and then people can can catch up as they as people continue to join. So, um, we're thrilled to have uh, Alex uh, Alice Wexler here with us today uh, to share her fabulous HD story. Um, her family have been a key part of HD advocacy for decades, and it really is a privilege to have Alice uh, here with us today. So these are 30 minute sessions, which will follow the format of around a 20 minute talk and 10 minutes time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom. And we also have the chat function if you want to chat amongst yourselves. Uh, but if questions could be in the Q&A box, that way we can um, we can keep an eye on them. Uh, so I'll hand I'll hand over to Alice now. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. And hello to everyone, uh, and thank you to Matt and to all the organizers of this HDYO conference Congress for inviting me to speak. Actually, Matt invited Nancy and me together, uh, but although Nancy wanted to be here, I'm going to speak for both of us today. As many of you know, uh, Nancy today is living with Huntington's disease, and still with the same uh, courage and resilience and uh, strength and determination that she's always shown all of her life. And she's working with a writer uh, on her autobiography too. So that will be a really great book to be able to read. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about growing up in a family with Huntington's almost 50 years ago, how we responded to the challenge of HD and what we learned as a family over the past uh, decades. So, um, Nancy and I grew up in a family of secrets. Uh, we knew nothing about Huntington's until our mom was diagnosed with it. And by that time, Nancy and I were in our 20s. We were in graduate school and we were living far from home. So that's when we learned not only that our mother had HD, but also that our uncles had had it, uh, cousins and our grandfather all of whom had this illness. Uh, they lived far away from us, so we didn't see them very often. And um, so that's why it, it was easier, I guess, to keep, the, um, keep that knowledge away from us. And of course, we learned at the same time that we had a 50-50 risk, each of us, and that if we had children, um, any children that we might have, also we could pass on that risk. Um, we certainly got the message that we should not have children of our own. Our parents had known the family history, um, but they, like many parents in Huntington's families, they uh, chose not to tell us. I think they, they felt that if they ignored it, they could protect us and then maybe it would go away. But in 1968, when mom's symptoms grew um, obvious, uh, whoops, did I lose you? <laughs> No, you've just stopped sharing the slides, but we can still see and hear you. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> her, her symptoms grew obvious. And so dad at that time told us that um, the truth, he told us the truth straight out. And, um, but he also told us at the same time that he was gonna try to do something about it. Uh, he went public right away. And um, he, oops. He uh, told us he was, uh, he reached out to Marjorie Guthrie, who had started the first HD association 
the committee to combat Huntington's the year before. And, my, and dad uh, reached out to researchers such as there were at the time and uh, the clinicians and especially to young people, to young scientists uh, to try to get them interested in Huntington's <clears throat> because they might not know actually about this but they had new, new technologies and they had open minds and he wanted to get them interested in um, doing research on Huntington's. So by day he was a therapist and uh, that's what he did. He was a psychoanalyst. And by night, he went out to uh, meetings. He gave talks. He um, <clears throat> went to fundraising events. He held fundraising events. <clears throat> and he wrote hundreds of letters <clears throat> to all kinds of people, including a lot of HD families, offering uh, help and comfort to them. Within a few years, he organized what became the Hereditary Disease Foundation that has inspired uh, and funded much pioneering research and continues to do that today. People often have asked me how he uh, managed to do what he did. How did he manage to accomplish what he did? In many ways, the timing was auspicious uh, because 1968 was a momentous year historically. And the 60s were a decade of a lot of grassroots organizing of social movements, and especially of young people um, all over the world, not just in the US. And so it was a, a little bit like 2020 uh, when we see a, a lot of uh, organizing going on. And uh, dad brought a lot of skills also into his work, uh, both not only was he a psychotherapist, but he had been a champion debater and a um, lawyer before he became a therapist. So he was a very good public speaker. And he had connections with the art world and the entertainment world, Hollywood. So he could bring Huntington's to the media. But I think his most important asset was his optimistic attitude. The idea that you could do something about Huntington's, that you didn't have to just sit around and wait for doom. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was that he had experience with another disease, schizophrenia. He had, had treated uh, patients with schizophrenia, very severe uh, mental illness in the, in the years before there was medication um, for that illness. And he had actually had some success with talk therapy. And so <clears throat> I think from that uh, experience, he, he had um, a belief that you could do something to improve people's lives, living with even seemingly hopeless diseases. And he was willing to experiment, uh, to try new approaches. He had a lot of confidence and he had a lot of courage. And I think he carried all of that into his work on Huntington's. And as I'll say in a minute, and Nancy uh, inherited that and learned from him too. Um, now, we were lucky in another way, because often women and girls are the ones expected to be the unpaid caregivers. Sometimes they're uh, called home from college or from their jobs to take care of relatives who are ill. Our dad uh, was determined that we should be able to get an education. He did not call us home to take care of our mom. And, uh, he had, and they had been divorced already for several years. Um, by the time that she was diagnosed. But he took on the responsibility for her care. Now they weren't living together, it wasn't hands-on care, but he found places for her to live and um, checked out her doctors, he paid her bills, he negotiated the bureaucracy and all of the paperwork that's involved with, um, with such long-term care and managed all of her emergencies. And what that meant for Nancy and me was that when we came home to visit, we could have quality time with our mother, um, which, which really was uh, a cred incredible benefit. Most of all, our dad believed that girls were the equals of uh, boys and deserved equal opportunities. So I think today, one of our challenges to make sure that all the caregiving responsibilities don't fall on girls and women, uh, that it's shared equally between women and men, and that full-time caregiving should get paid. Um, now, I'm going to say a lot more about Nancy's work, but I just wanted to mention something about my attitude uh, in response to Huntington's and learning this traumatic news. Um, 
and it was very traumatic. Uh, I was just the opposite of my father. I turned my back on Huntington's. I didn't want, I was in the middle of graduate school studying for a doctorate in history. And I, that was hard enough without, <clears throat> without uh, thinking of, having to think about HD. Uh, I wanted to be a historian and a writer. And so um, that's what I did uh, for quite a while. Um, again, I didn't want to think about Huntington's disease. I wanted to think about Cuba. And I wrote uh, two books about an anarchist named Emma Goldman. Um, nothing to do with HD. But then uh, eventually I did get interested in Huntington's and decided my father and sister were having, uh, doing all of these great things and that I wanted to be part of it too. And so then that was the time when I began to say, well, maybe I could use my own skills and make a contribution to Huntington's as well. As a historian, I could write about the history and about our own family experience as well. So um, <clears throat> now um, Nancy, of course, followed in uh, our father's footsteps and she was starting graduate school. So she really made Huntington's into the focus of her study. And um, as you'll see, uh, she wrote her dissertation on Huntington's uh, out of which came some really early classic work, this wonderful paper that she wrote really as a graduate student uh, that's still one of the classics about uh, living at risk for Huntington's disease. After she graduated from graduate school, then she was involved in almost every major initiative uh, involving HD. The first thing that she did was to head this commission, the Congressional Commission on Huntington's in the mid 1970s, uh, to study all the problems of, of Huntington's families in the United States and to come up with some policy and research recommendations. Nancy was very young. Again, uh, she was in her early 30s when she did this, and she was the boss of people twice her age, including dad, who is, you can see here in the slide next to her. And she did a brilliant job. Uh, the Huntington's Commission was extremely successful and uh, led to many new initiatives, um, including her next big project, which was the Venezuela Research Project. And <clears throat> in the early 1980s, Nancy began organizing annual uh, teams of geneticists, neurologists, uh, nurses, social workers, and many postdocs uh, and even graduate students who came down to um, Maracaibo to visit the families living around Lake Maracaibo uh, that had had Huntington's in their families for generations. If you remember, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, new technologies for mapping genes were emerging. Um, and, but it, you needed to have uh, very large families to be able to study uh, in order to use them. Uh, so Nancy started bringing a team to Venezuela every year and stay for a month uh, and to work with the families. And I think Nancy's genius was to make the families partners in this research, because one of the crucial things was to learn the family histories. And this was knowledge that the families themselves had, uh, and she, um, that which she persuaded them to share so that uh, the researchers could make big pedigrees. And one of the ways that Nancy enlisted their help was that she said to them, I too am at risk for Huntington's. I have a personal stake in this research. And, and she showed them the mark that she too had donated blood and skin samples, which is what was needed also to um, do this research with DNA. In addition to that, uh, they, the teams always brought medical help to the families. Uh, it wasn't just a one-way street. Uh, they brought medical aid and uh, eventually um, Nancy and others helped to set up a nursing home called the Casa Ogar uh, in one of the barrios there, which for about 15 years or maybe 20, um, what provided great services to the HD families. They are living in, in one of the barrios. 
Um, this is Anne Young, by the way, one a, a, a brilliant neurologist and HD um, researcher who accompanied Nancy uh, every year to Venezuela. <clears throat> so the point is here, what might have been a liability for Nancy being at risk for Huntington's, she made into a benefit and an advantage that actually helped in the research. The third thing that Nancy did um, was to lead the legendary uh, Huntington's Collaborative Research Group that found the Huntington's gene in 1993. And this was uh, an incredible enterprise involving <clears throat> six labs and maybe uh, up to 100 people all over the world really uh, working on um, trying to map the Huntington's disease gene. And if you remember, um, this was in the era before email. Uh, so communication was extremely difficult. I remember actually electronic mail, as they called it, was just coming into being and setting up that electronic mail was a big deal. Uh, so Nancy was really uh, a, the leader, one of the chief leaders of, of this huge effort. And dad uh, was involved too. He was, as a therapist, he would come to the meeting of the meetings of the principal investigators and he was the problem solver, um, the ombudsman, and counselor, and mentor, and therapist, uh, sometimes to the whole group and, and even to individuals. And um, so that was a 10 year effort uh, that led finally to identifying the expanded repeat of the HD gene. And you can see that it was big news here on the front page of the New York Times. So today as a result of um, that work of my sister and uh, father and many, many hundreds and even thousands of other people, uh, young people today uh, in Huntington's families have options that were not available when Nancy and I were growing up. Um, not only pre-symptomatic genetic testing, but pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD, improved medications, many more experienced and knowledgeable clinicians, uh, and more strategies just for living well with Huntington's, thanks to pioneering work of people like Jimmy Pollard uh, and groups like the brilliant Ding Ding Dong based in Paris. And of course, we have the clinical trials for various gene-lowering therapies going on which are, are truly exciting and, and offer great promise. But we still face many challenges. Um, and one of the biggest ones is inequality of access. Who, who has access to the benefits that are already available in some parts of the world, but not in others? Um, <clears throat> PGD is a good example. Um, it's even in the United States, it's expensive. It's uh, not often not covered by insurance. Uh, it's not accessible to everyone. So, uh, and caregiving uh, also, good caregiving is not accessible to people in many parts of my country and of parts, different parts of the world. So we need to fight to make the benefits accessible um, to all of those people who need them. And the challenges of pre-symptomatic testing still uh, continue. Um, many people believe that uh, if the technology exists, you should use it. And they can't understand why people might not want to get a predictive test if it's available to them. Uh, they think that you have a social responsibility to get tested. I don't agree with that. I think no one should feel coerced into getting tested. Certainly there are many good reasons to get a genetic test, but choosing not to get tested um, does not mean that you're choosing to be ignorant or to be in denial. It can mean that you're choosing to accept the uncertainty and the diversity and the responsibility of living in an uncertain world. So I'd like to close with a uh, reflection on um, family, the, the meaning of family, which has a bittersweet resonance for me. Even in the Huntington's world, we hear slogans like, 
family is everything. And some of us, uh, such as my sister and me, have tiny families. And some of us have no family at all because of Huntington's disease. Many of us have lost parents and grandparents and siblings and cousins and uncles and aunts and children on account of Huntington's. Some of us have family members that don't understand HD or who continue to deny it when it's right in front of them. So what should we do about family? My response is that we uh, have to make, and we are making new families. And I think all of you in HDYO are creating new families in this amazing organization where you're making such a difference in so many young people's lives. You are part of our family and I hope Nancy and I are part of yours. And I keep on doing the terrific work that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice, for that um, that amazing uh, talk. Really much appreciated. We have um, a couple of questions, if that's okay. I can read them out um, and then maybe you can give some, some answers to them. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> that's great. So the first one is from Sean Jessica Lewis, who says, um, it was a question that came through at the start that says, amazing, where is the best place to purchase your books? Uh, uh, they're available online. I think even on the HDFYO website, but they're, I think from Amazon or anywhere online. Great, thank you, Alice. And um, if you can't find them, Sean, just clue us. If you um, follow up with HDO afterwards, we can, we can point you in the right direction as well. Um, the next one we have is from Kathy, who says, how was it living with HD at home? Did your father's background in therapy help you and your sister navigate through the illness within your family? Yes, it definitely did. Uh, I should say that we did, my sister and I were older when we found out about Huntington's and we were no longer living at home. So in many ways, we did not face those challenges that people have when they have a parent who is um, symptomatic and they're much younger and living with them. So we didn't actually have that experience, but he definitely uh, helped us negotiate it in the relation in our relations and we spent a lot of time you know visiting home but it wasn't quite the same no definitely thank you um for that alice um so the next question is two more questions at the moment which we should have time for so the next question is um i wanted um what's well, more of a, a comment to say that um i wanted to thank you alice and um, this person says i'm from a family with a different genetic disease but also 50 percent at risk um, recently, um, their therapist gave them one of your books to read and it's helped them greatly. And now they're writing um, their own book and you're an inspiration, so thank you. Oh, wonderful. That person says. Um, and then the last one, question we have at the moment and keep adding your questions, I see another one just popped in. Um, do you have any advice for those that are struggling with balancing their own passions and living with Huntington's disease in the family? That is a, a great question and it's very, that's a very tough challenge. Uh, I think all of us struggle with that, um, how to have that balance. Uh, one of the things that I think is so crucial is um, that, that's been helpful to Nancy and me is have as friends, you know, um, I mean, family uh, outside the household can be supportive, but I think actually having a strong friendship network is really crucial. And for me, that's been a, a really strong support, even if they're not, you know, always talking about Huntington's, but um, just having a good support network who could, and people who, who know uh, what your passions are and understand them and can help kind of keep you on track. Because it's very easy to get off track, you know, when you're kind of pulled apart in many uh, directions. And to just to keep, uh, an awareness. The second thing, I think, um, you know, going, getting, seeing a therapist or a counselor or being in a group uh, can be really helpful. Uh, I think we all need help, outside help. It's not weakness to go see a therapist or to want to get counseling uh, in whatever form you can. It's, it's a strength to say, I need help. <laughs> 
And it's really great when you feel like you have somebody in your corner, you know, who is really on your side and can help you negotiate all of these challenges. No, that's that's fantastic advice. Thank you, Alice. And, and just to say again, I know Matt covered it and in the welcome video, but if anyone does need any advice or information today, we have the HDO booths, which you can go to. And obviously we're always here for you after the event as well. So I think we have time for one more question, which is from Charlie, um, who says, uh, amazing work. Looking back on your family's journey, what do you feel we have now in terms of support and guidance that, that you wish you had had growing up? Uh, a, a group like HDYO, <laughs> <laughs> which I think, is a, I think is a fantastic group and all of you uh, are, are so creative, you know, and uh, I wish that I had had that. Uh, and I know Nancy does too. Uh, I think that would have been a big help. <laughs> No, that's fantastic. Thank you, Alice. And then just to say lots of people are messaging in the chat just saying how much they appreciated you talking and how much uh, they've appreciated um, everything you've shared today. I know it's meant a lot to a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, that concludes this session, everybody. So thank you for joining. Um, next up, we have um, on track one, we have Kadida sharing her experiences of growing up in Pakistan with uh, Huntington's disease and on track two we have Dr Squitiri talking about the biology of juvenile Huntington's disease and um, so thank you very much again and we'll end we'll end this session now thank you Alice okay, thank you Amy. bye everybody